I start to talk about um, the compressed natural gas uh, issue, the CNG initiative of the federal government, which has now become uh, uh, more of a phenomenon than it was uh, just uh, a few years ago. Of course, we've talked uh, on this program quite a number of times uh, about the adoption of uh, this alternative, as we now know it, in light of uh, what petrol price is doing to the pockets of uh, everyday Nigerians. But the challenge of rolling out this initiative, as laudable as some people say it otherwise is, has also been very visible uh, by those who are uh, pushing it. So important it is to the government that there is even an agency uh, rolling out this scheme and midwifing the entire process. Uh, how effective or otherwise that has been uh, remains to be seen. We've seen a potpourri of uh, reactions, some of them counter uh, to this uh, laudable uh, objective otherwise. But uh, let's talk to someone who has a handle on both the technicalities and the economics of uh, this conversation. Dr. Wisdom Enang is an energy uh, sector consultant and expert. He joins us live via Zoom from Lagos this morning. Uh, Doc, thank you for taking all the time to join us on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, let's begin with what we're now saying with the free bus rides, the CNG powered bus, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you and I have not really taken out time to maybe discuss specifics re regarding timelines. But, but talk to us as to how, ideally, a scheme like this, considering the peculiarity of the circumstances under which we operate as a country, should be ruled out. Okay, the CNG scheme, um, you know, really needs certain imperatives. And before I can draw those imperatives, I'd like to talk about the tenets of energy uh, security, which has to do with affordability, accessibility, and availability. Now, the biggest challenge with CNG is that though it, it does address the affordability component, but the issue of accessibility and availability is the biggest concern so you're asking yourselves uh how do you get reliable supply of the cng in other regions outside say lagos or abuja i think that's the most important thing that people are asking themselves and and, and trying to wonder for um and then uh you find out that the government is trying to quickly roll out some of these schemes but it is also meeting a a backlash because of the fact that you know other countries for example uh like um, you know malaysia i believe or is indonesia or malaysia one of them has recently uh taken a back seat on some of those gas uh you know technologies citing the safety concerns because of the the, the ability to manufacture and certify cylinders and so this is now a, a challenge that the government is facing however i, I think um we also have the, the, the challenge of uh, the adoption of the technology itself because of uh, domestication, uh, how fast we can domesticate the technology. Uh, I mean, it's not just enough to get imported technology and apply it in Nigeria. Sometimes it helps if you can domesticate that technology and, and own it from a research standpoint. And that's where we're also struggling at the moment. Mm. Uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, that struggle, again, it's uh, very visible, given what we now see uh, in this country. Nigeria is particularly dealing with um, uh, quite uh, severe economic hardship at this point in time. Of course, that has been the case for a while now. But let's look at, yes, affordability. A lot of persons say when you uh, place the CNG costs and that of the traditional petrol, so to speak, side by side, of course, the, the CNG will win all day, every day. But even, even at that, the, the, if you like, the starter pack costs is not uh, very pocket-friendly for most Nigerians. I mean, everyday Nigerians, for example. Talk to us about the economics of this narrative. Yes, I mean, the uh, starter pack, uh, like you said, is not very pocket-friendly uh, because uh, at the time it was about 400 and something thousand naira for the conversion kick. Uh, right now, we're talking about uh, 1 million at least uh, for the least one. Um, and, and yes, it is not pocket-friendly. It's just when you run the math from an operational standpoint that you get to see some of those savings. Uh, and, and, you know, take advantage of the gains and ultimately that would pay off the startup pack. 
The other issue that I think uh, it's worth noting is that other countries, for example, uh, I'd like to say Ghana and even uh, India have done something to overcome that initial inertia from a cost perspective. What they've done is to say, okay, uh, if you are having, if you're earning a certain amount and you want to convert, they've got uh, energy funds within the regular banks and those banks will provide those funds for you. It will help you with conversion. It will help you with any energy transition project at a domestic, uh, domestic level. And they will take that money over time at a very low interest rate. And what that simply means, maybe in your regular banks, you can go and ask for, uh, you know, they want to apply for, say, a millionaire to help you with your conversion. And, and that money is not paid to you, by the way. It's paid to the conversion center who would then send them, uh, say, the serial number of the kits that was used for your conversion. And that's locked as part of the paperwork. And then you can take it home. And over time, it, your, your, you sign an agreement that it, your money is deducted at source from the source that you had declared. Uh, and sometimes those sources are, are maybe government employment or private employment. Uh, in, in those countries, they do have a list of the employers for which they, uh, they have gotten a sort of an agreement for, for them to uh, undertake such, um, you know, such a loan with, with their staff. So those are some of the ways that we can overcome the inertia, but it is a very a strong inertia. Uh, and definitely we do need government to help subsidize some of those kids, because if you're thinking about making money ultimately from the uh, one, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that you want to expand the industry, two, you're also thinking about making money from the fact that you also want to ensure you know, pe people adopt that uh, source of energy, as well, um, you, you would want to reduce the inertia, uh, you know, the front loading inertia. And the way to do that is to say, okay, uh, we'll give some subsidies for the first movers. So what the government can do is say, look, the first few people, we have a hundred thousand slots. The first hundred thousand that want to adopt this technology, we're ready to give it to you at maybe half price. And that would even create a huge rush where people would even subscribe. So you hear where uh, government are offering, making an offering, and then there's that over subscribers on that offering. I think that's one of the ways I would put some icing on the cake to help people even come forward with interest. All right, let me ask you this. When you look at where we are today and the process we've seen so far, uh, Doc, would you say we got off on the right footing with this initiative? Well, I think I like to tell people there are two ways to jump. It's either your sorry, there are two ways to uh, go through change. It's either you're pushed or you jump, and none of it is comfortable. The only thing is the imperatives that would have been on either side. If the government uh, allowed us to jump as at when we're ready, that means certain imperatives would have been built. We would have had a more developed supply base would have had more accessible start, uh, you know, points of um, uh, you know, inventory disbursement uh, for, for the CNG. I would have also had even more gas infrastructure um, locally, because remember, a lot of our developments for gas infrastructure are export-oriented just because of the legacy uh, of the industry. The industry was set up for export. It's only now that we're looking at domesticating some of our energy through gas. So yes, I, I do agree. There were some uh, after kind of afterthoughts that came in, and that's driving us well, uh, neither moving forward nor backwards because we are held spellbound by some of those um, indecisions that we had, uh, you know, that plagued us right from the beginning. Uh, and then I do also believe that there is no way to use just uh, a command and conquer approach uh, to run this. And by that I mean. Even if you said let's uh, deregulate and increase the prices of PMS, and at the same time uh, you 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 do the same for other fuels because other countries have done the same. They increase the taxes on the normal uh, conventional fuels. They also uh, put subsidies on the CNG without solving the infrastructure problem. You will not have a, have a high penetration rate. It's still going to be the same challenge that we're having without solving the safety concerns that people are having uh, based on how well you, uh, you know, how well you, you know, intimate people on how to utilize 
uh, the gas technology. We're always going to have the inertia. People are going to be scared. People are going to be benchmarking uh, their thoughts about using it versus, you know, the concerns that they're having, the safety concerns that they're having about incidents that are occurring even in their neighborhood or even abroad. So I think the government has a very serious work to do. The funding is another problem. I, I keep saying, look, um, and I ask myself, when we talk about pension funds, and we're talking about some of the idle funds I think we can tap into, I think for running our energy transition show, I'll be very, very honest and say, look, I, I, if I were the government, right, we, I know they do allow, I think, 25% if you've left your job for a while and you want to tap into your pension fund. I think one other way to do it is to allow people to tap into their pension fund for another 10% to fund their energy transition needs. Because to be honest, I, I, I'm, I'm one of the people that actually ask what really happens to these pension funds, especially for people that work, get the pension savings done, and then do not live up to that age. So I think th those are some of the idle pool funds that we can allow individuals to tap into to overcome the inertia. I mean, we are at the point where we've been pushed by circumstances. And so desperate times calls for desperate actions. And I think the government needs to think out of the box in order to solve some of these uh, challenges and create imperatives for CNG technologies to thrive. Hmm. Uh, uh, quite an interesting one. Uh, uh, it appears, I mean, it happens uh, apparently that we are in an era where across the world, the conversation uh, centers basically on uh, energy transition. We, we see Nigerian public officials Sometimes uh, the president of the vice president attending some of these events even beyond the shores of Africa. Uh, how much has that been a blessing or otherwise to us as a country? Right. I mean, it's a, it's a blessing because uh, we have gone out there to advocate that we're ready for the transition. We're ready to create a business. Uh, but that uh, whole body language alone and not mm. even the command uh, approach can help us to do the transition because let me tell you what india did I'll, I'll give you india's story india started with saying the supreme court said look we're going to raise the emissions limits to make sure that for you to even attempt to meet that limit you must use an alternative vehicular technology or, or of some sort and not just a conventional one and that was when cng uh hybrid electric vehicles electric vehicles became uh in view but they didn't stop there. India decided, okay, we are going to reduce the tariffs. We are going to even create, um, you know, some sort of uh, incentive to help the first movers get some advantage. And like I said, the first hundred thousand people that want to subscribe across the country apply through the portal. We are going to give you certain incentives to allow you subscribe onto the CNG initiative. That's one because what you happen there is when people when people subscribe initially, you might find out that. You called for 100,000, but over 2 million will subscribe. And then you now say, okay, look, we can only do this for 100,000, but for the rest, we are, only we are going to give you, let's say, 5% support. But all, ultimately, you have a net, a, you know, a net that have got people in there, but and, and then you're trying to churn them in from just people that are interested in the interested bucket to people that actually enroll and convert. So that's another way to do it. Uh, and then the third way to do it is to partner with companies because ultimately, let me tell you what's going on. A lot of companies have said, look, um, a lot of companies, for example, in Ghana, because of the way the government has done, has told their staff, look, there's this government uh, incentives for companies that can help some of their staff convert to uh, an enroll on into energy transition. Uh, can we help you say, for example, we're, we're going to help you convert uh, put money forward towards your conversion or whatever amount you have. If the conversion is 1 million, you bring 500, we bring 500, and then we can put that towards our tax credits, towards to the government. Mm. I think we need very ingenious ways. And then one of the ways to say, look, going forward, any vehicle, regardless of what happens, um, must be from manufacturer, must be CNG enabled. And I, and I tell you what, we have, even if you want to buy Toyota today, if you are buying as a government and you're buying, say, maybe um, 500 units, for example, Toyota would easily say, look, we've got models, we can retrofit what you want, we can do an aftermarket hybrid vehicle for you, we can also retrofit the uh, CNG kits and bring them in country. These are all possibilities. And so the government can even start from themselves, say, going forward, 
any new vehicle that we want to bring in is going to be CNG enabled for anybody, regardless. Because when you send that, you, when you send that signal, you're sending a signal that you're consistent. You know what you're doing. You, you're walking the talk, and you're also sending the signal that yes, we are, you're trying to stimulate the growth of a market that you can possibly expand for an investor to come in and and, and you know partake, take part of. And if that market is still a niche, it's not yet a market. You're just still thinking about it. It hasn't matured. Uh, then investors are skeptical, and and that's usually what happens. So I think the government has a lot of work to do to engender and create a, a market out of the subsisting need at the moment. Hmm. It, it sounds like we, we have a long way to go uh, in this regard. Obviously, you have made allusion to the uh, public-private partnership elements. Uh, I was hoping uh, we, we could discuss uh, in this regard. But let's talk about timeline for things like this, because most times, we roll out initiatives like this, and we are not so clear as to what the turnaround time is, what the faces will be, uh, who, are, who are bringing into the nets, and, and things like that. And the next thing you know is there's election cycle again, a government leaves office, a new government comes in, policy some assault, and, and what have you. Walk us through this confusion. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'd like to say from the beginning is that in most countries, one of the enablers that makes policies to work is mm. when there is a, a legal binding around the policy itself. So uh, I think we, we need to learn to legislate our policies and, 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 and look at the one of the key success of that uh, approach, which is the NCA, the, sorry, the NLNG. And if you look at it, you find out that the NLNG today is a success because there's some legislative framework that means that investors that are coming in know that this is not just uh, some sort of brainwave from uh, the current administration, that it is something that has been passed into law and the law would make sure that it works regardless of who comes in. And so they can put their money on there. It's, mm. it's tied to the sovereignty of the country. So that's the first step we need to take. If we're serious, go look at the framework. There is no singular one that known to me exclusive, a legal back backing that is given to CNG, but we should develop it. It all starts with developing our regulations. It all starts with developing our, you know, some sort of terms of use of technology. It all starts with developing our standards. And so the, the, it, the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to show uh, investors that you're not just talking about it, but there is the right body language in addition to all the other market imperatives. But if mm. you're asking what is the timeline, I see between, uh, you know, between 18 to 24 months is the time that we we'll begin to see a very, very uh, holistic uh, stimulation of the market. But then... It is not going to be federal driven alone. We will need the subnationals, we will need the private sector. I think the subnationals need to really drive this as well. If we do not get that cooperation and it's just a top down approach, it's just going to end as, um, you know, it's just, it's just going to end as, as if it's a feasibility study. It's never going to proliferate the market enough to create that, uh, you know, such a market activity out of the need and that will allow investors to tap you. Remember, each time people come to do their math analysis, they say, well, we have over 200 million people in Nigeria, and this is the, uh, the market we intend to capture. But without the right imperative, you, are, you don't even have a market. You have, one, you have 200 people with the need for cheaper mm. fuel, but then there is no market because you haven't been able to create the imperatives to stimulate the market out of the need. Uh, quite a challenge but, but then there, there's still the concern about how that while we're pursuing the cng as uh, maybe the alternative who knows maybe ultimately the future uh it, it happens that conversations around portacot refinery dangote refinery and all of the issues around the so-called dirty field uh, are still here it, it, could that be a distraction i'm asking while on the one hand we are discussing CNG, on the other hand we are still focused on crude and all the products from it, uh, does that not distract us from the amount of effort that we should be putting into our pursuit of the CNG? 
No, it doesn't distract us at all. And I'll give you context. Remember, I'll give you some numbers. Africa only contributes 4% of the global uh, you know, emissions footprint. And so Africa has advocated for, and the world has accepted the need for a just transition for Africa. So it's not about uh, transition or uh, energy transition based on, okay, this is what the Euro Europeans are doing, let's do it. It's a just transition. What does just transition do? A just transition leverages a cleaner form of energy that is affordable, available, and accessible to be able to enable that transition in a way that does not alter the economic situation of your country for worse. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to go for, say, nuclear energy, but that's going to alter the economics of your country because perhaps it makes it more expensive and all of that and the safety components, that's not a just transition. So that's the first foot to put forward. The second foot to put forward is that Africans said, look, um, gas is the, is, is, is the transition fuel that we have, but we're also looking at reducing the carbon footprint even from the conventional fuels. And one of the ways to do that is to either consume more efficiently or to reduce the per capita consumption of PMS. Hmm. And if you look at our per capita consumption of PMS, right, you look at um, how, how, you know, the PMS consumption per, per our population, you find out that according to the report from the NMDPRA, it has dropped by about 90%. So that means that, you know, because of the high cost, we have reduced the consumption. So if we divide the carbon footprint of the our PMS consumption versus the population, it has dramatically dropped. So that's even energy transition on its own. It's not just the move from one form of energy to the other. It's the utilization of energy more efficiently. And if the driver is a cost factor, then so be it. So ultimately, these are all coming together in the narrative of energy transition. But I think the biggest distraction for us has been the failure to develop a framework for, to harness our gas, both uh, dom for domestic use, like we've seen. Uh, we, the, we, for example, in um, Nigeria, we have less than 7,000 kilometers of pipelines, and we have the eighth largest reserve in the world uh, for gas, and then the number one largest reserve in Africa. But India, Nowhere to be found among the countries that produce oil or gas, but they have 79,000 kilometers of gas pipeline. What does that tell you? India understands the role of gas pipelines as it correlates to the level of industrialization that any nation can achieve. So in a nutshell, we have been hampered by our indecisions and poor decisions leading up to today and not really the functionality of those refineries that allow us to be able to achieve a just energy transition let's, let's talk about some of the as we wrap up now doc um, awareness on the part of nigerians uh, the cng thing uh, especially for starters still seems like an elitist uh, um, initiative of some kind right so how do we get the message to the gra grassroots in such a way that the person with the least or the the minimal uh, education whatever it is understands what the conversation is about very, very interesting question. I, I, I think, you know, this is where the government needs to know that we need to bring the guys that are experts to the table. If I were to be the president, what would I do? I will realize that, look, there's a very limited reach within which we can reach with my uh, presidential initiative committee. And so I'm going to ask them to look, bring academias, to recruit academias from all the universities into the team recruit uh or, or what we call initiative champions from all the various institutions to the team and also ask that they bring uh groups technical groups like the nigerian society of engineers for example who are going to hold technical workshops so it, 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 across the various branches it, i think they're well represented in the uh, in the major cities in uh nigeria and so you make sure that those guys are brought to the table they buy into that technology. We have a, you know, a stakeholder deliberation and they put together a framework that would allow people appreciate the economics and the safety aspects of CNG. In addition to 
uh, intimating those people on how they would safely use CNG so that it doesn't uh, pose a problem from a safety standpoint. And then when you do that, you send these guys out to the nooks and the crannies of the country and they will help you sell the story. And it's even better a story to sell by a third party that is an independent uh, expert in that field than the government selling it. So I think this is not just the presidential initiative wanting to do everything and anything. It should be them driving the initiative but other people executing that initiative. And I think from an advocacy standpoint, NGO groups are very important. We have we need to have the technical folks from the university who are going to help us tell that story. The Niger um, you know, technical groups like the Nigerian Society of Engineers are also professional groups uh, and all the safety groups very important to drive that story.